Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to be grumpy, unhappy, dissatisfied, or at <laughs> disease, you can see where this is going, with the world around you, then do we have the show for you. Today I'll be talking with a Buddhist monk, the Venerable Ajahn Brahm, about <laughs> abbot of the, I'll <laughs> never get this name right, Budhinyana. Yeah. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Monastery in Serpentine, Western Australia, the spiritual director of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, a spiritual advisor to numerous Buddhist societies, and the author of numerous books, including Who Ordered This Truckload of Dung, Mindfulness, Bliss, and Beyond, a Meditator's Handbook, The Art of Disappearing, and a new fun favorite of mine, Don't Worry, Be Grumpy. And that's what we'll be talking about today, about what it takes to be grumpy, dissatisfied, and disease with life, noise, and the world around and inside of us. That plus we'll talk about 50 strokes of the cat, the push-up routine, the 70% rule, <laughs> selling encyclopedias, a safe haven for spiders, and why it's so important to let go of the banana. <laughs> so welcome <laughs> to the show, Ajan. Are you ready to shine? Hi. I am ready to roll. Woohoo! So before we dive right into things, I've got to ask, <laughs> where did your mom end up putting the soft wombat? Uh, in the trash can. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it was eventually you had to. There was no other place for mm -hmm. it. There was too many things. Just like everybody else, sometimes we need to empty out our life, empty out our mind, so we can have a lot of freedom to be able to be open to the next moment. I like that. I spent uh, last Sunday editing shows. Usually I edit shows daily, and I spent the whole day editing all of my shows, which bought me freedom for the whole week to be able yeah, exactly. to think, or, or even not think, to be at peace. Exactly. So that's what we, I advise people to do. You don't have to do all that work. I have the saying that never do today what you can put off until tomorrow because you might die tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't die tonight, it doesn't matter. You get somebody else to do it tomorrow. <laughs> so in other words, life is not about doing stuff. It's about so stopping doing stuff so you can enjoy life. So then I've got to ask, if we go back, we won't go through your whole history today. We don't, we don't have quite enough time, but, yeah. but you did go. I'm not that old. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> You're not old. Outside my history, I'm not that old. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll go over a few things. You studied theoretical okay. physics to become a monk in Thailand. What happened? That's right. It's really important studying theoretical physics because I saw all those uh, theoretical physicists. They were all crazy. They were experts in their field. Mm -hmm. Some of them were Nobel laureates, but they were stupid in life. What's the point of having a Nobel Prize in physics mm -hmm. if you don't understand how to live with yourself and how to live with your partner? How did you start to come to that conclusion? Just by watching all these people which I was hanging out with mm -hmm. who were supposed to be smart but they're only smart in a narrow part of life. And the part of life which really was important, you know, the inner happiness, the peace, mm -hmm. their joy, that they were stupid in. And I thought that's not the sort of person I'd like to be. So you went from there, you finished, you got your degree first. Yeah, and, yep. And then you went over to Thailand. Exactly, to become a monk. And what was the transition like? Easy, it was wonderful, because the whole point of like studying something like physics was trying to get a handle on the meaning of life and realize you're looking in the wrong place. Instead of looking out there, you start to look inside, and that's what the only transition was. The same search, the same methodology, but focusing on something inside rather than outside of yourself. Was it like for myself, one of the most blissful experiences, and, and I used to live on, on Hawaii for about four years, one of the most blissful experiences was being stuck in an airplane for 8, 10, 12 hours, or going to Southeast Asia and, and, and doubling that time because I had nowhere to be, nothing to do, and, and frankly, I'd just be with myself. Exactly. That's the same with your life. You are stuck in an aircraft called this body and it started off from your mother's womb and it's going to the grave and it's, you're stuck in it. You can't get out. So the point is, is what are you doing with this life between the cradle to the grave? You're on this flight. So enjoy it. You all go to the same destination. So this is why we learn how to make fun of life, understand it, make peace with life and share that fun and peace with others. So going from there, we dive into your book a little bit. Uh, what is the monk method for peeling bananas? 
<laughs> well, the Mark method, first of all, the peeling banana story, that's when uh, I found out that in jungles, the monkeys always peel the banana from the, uh, not the stalk, from the other end where the, the flower was. And it's much easier to peel the banana from that end. But usually I was just following what other people did, and they peeled the banana from the stalk, which is much harder. I was following other people, and I learned from the experts. The experts on bananas are monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and so I looked at what they were doing, and they did it the completely opposite the way that human beings did it. So I learned from experts, and it's the same you know, with some of the ideas of psychology, of learning how to be peaceful and happy. The experts were those, uh, those great teachers who lived out in the jungles, who were just had hardly anything, but were the happiest people I'd ever seen. So those sorts of teachers, I was following them. They weren't the monkeys, they were the monks. You know, these people who've been meditating for you know, 30, 40, 50 years, and they had such wisdom. So I decided to learn from them how to peel the banana in the right way, how to create happiness in this life. Beautiful. So let's go from there. One of the ones I'm always fascinated with, uh, what are the benefits of dog poop in life? <laughs> well, look, you're always going to get some. Can I say in the program? You, you certainly can, and I have a bleep key, so have fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because when I actually wrote that book and they had the title for it, Who Ordered This Truckload of Dung? I wanted Who Ordered This Truckload of Because that's what people say in the U.S. in movies. They say it in the book. And so I don't know what's wrong with the United States. Why You can say that in Australia. You can say that in Europe. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it makes it sort of much more rich. Like, like fertilizer. No, stop. <laughs> Your fertilizer, that's just anodyne. That's just dark. No, say it as it is. So you have lots of shit in life. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, the meaning of our lives. But the point is that when things happen to us, which you know, we break up with a relation, it's a, a tragedy in our life, like we lose our job or we lose someone we really love. Now what do we do about it? And we put this shit in our pockets and we carry it around with us. And so you notice if you carry around shit, you do tend to lose a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you stink. Step a little bit away so from you. So that's what we do with the shit. <laughs> you actually dig it in. You actually put it into your, your life, into your heart. And of course, no farm shit, we get the beautiful uh, mangoes and apples. But I always tell people that you know, if you've got a mango... Mm -hmm. Because you've dug dog shit in it especially, you must always remember when you eat that mango, what you're really eating? You're eating dog shit. <laughs> but it's been transformed into a very juicy mango. It, it, it's a hard one for people, particularly in the West, to wrap their mind around. I, I have a unique perspective. We wrote a book, my wife and I, a few years ago called Barefoot Running. And we're very strong proponents about connecting to the earth, getting grounded. And so right. I, I see us as, as an inside-out tree or an inside out plant we have the roots that go into the earth and the inside of us in our intestines and i see us as inside out and the dirt the soil is just the poop that moves through us and so i see right, us yeah. as a soil creator yeah but it's also we get a lot of that uh, great stuff from the poop of life mm -hmm. what are we actually growing we're growing like the flowers of wisdom the great trees of compassion and kindness and you don't get that if you have too easy a life you mentioned so sometimes it go on. Well, you mentioned in one of the stories, and it's in, and not to be callous. In one of the stories, the later stories in your book, you talked about a woman who had been through a horrific experience, and you found the words coming out of you that you were, in a sense, congratulating oh, yeah. her for it. Indeed, because what it was, you can't say these words to everybody. It has to be one on one mm -hmm. when a person's ready for that. Is actually instead of trying to get rid of that incredible, terrible experience, uh, instead of trying to sort of reject it as if it's not part of you, as if it never happened, mm -hmm. now that creates it and makes it much worse. It was a sense of accepting this, embracing it. And I've done that with many, many people. And there's, there's one of the groups I look after here, is, it's called the Australian Survivors of Torture and Trauma. These are refugees who have been through much worse than I mentioned in that book. Mm -hmm. you know, torture, you know, multiple rapes in these dark dungeons of the world. And they come to a place of freedom, like Australia or like the United States. Their body is free, but their heart is still in those dungeons being tortured. They remember it every night. 
And what you have to do, what really works, is actually not trying to reject that anymore, but actually literally bring it right in. It's a tough call, but it's wonderful when that happens. They bring it right in. That's part of them. That's who they are. And when they accept that, embrace that, there's a huge transformation. It's a catharsis. And an example of that, a few weeks ago, there was one woman who had been uh, very severely raped, badly raped, a terrible thing which happened to her. I can't understand how people can do that to one another. But uh, while she was telling me this, the young man said, that was terrible what happened to you. And she turned on him and said, what do you mean? You can't say that. That's who I am. That's made me who I am today. She was not rejecting it. She was not sort of uh, saying it was a wonderful thing happened to her, but she'd accepted it. It made her this incredibly amazing woman. So this is actually how we take this stuff and we really do actually transform it. We dig it in and it's afterwards we're free. What do we do for people who it wasn't something external? What was internal? Guilt, shame, they did something early in their lives which they're, they're not allowing themselves forgiveness. Yeah. This again, that we have a culture of blame and punishment. Mm -hmm. And that blame and punishment uh, is just like you do something at school and it's wrong and you get punished. No. If you make a mistake in math at school, you don't get punished for that. The teacher... Uh, points out your mistakes so you learn you know, your weak points so you can do much better later on so making mistakes in life is not to be punished but it's how we learn and how we grow but the trouble is that when somebody punishes you or puts you down scolds you it means that we get this terrible guilt that we're not good enough we've done something there's something wrong with us inside we weren't made properly and instead of sending it back to the manufacturer and getting a new model, which what most people want to do, you know, suicide or even other addictions which people will uh, sometimes try to lose themselves in, instead of sending the, manu the thing back to the manufacturer, we learn from it. We fix it up. And when we learn from it, we become far, far more, uh, greater human beings. So we're there to learn and grow from mistakes. So mistakes are part of life. Welcome mistakes. Welcome making an idiot of yourself, making a fool of yourself. It's a wonderful thing to do. If somebody makes a mistake at your monastery, do you give them 50 strokes of the cat? <laughs> that story. Yeah, we do. We order them because the 50 strokes of the cat, if you know that saying, was in the old days they would uh, get this terrible whip out mm -hmm. And they'd whip people 50 times with this very gross and brutal whip. And so for me, 50 strokes of the cat <laughs> doesn't mean a whipping. It means finding the nearest cat or dog will do, or a rabbit, mm -hmm. and stroke it one to learn some compassion and kindness. <laughs> so when a, person <laughs> when a person does want to be punished, mm -hmm. it means they haven't got enough kindness to themselves. When they're guilty, which is self-punishment, they need to learn some more compassion. One of the best ways of learning that it's from a little pet, a furry little animal who can just crawl on your lap and go to sleep with you stroking it. You learn kindness. And it's a kindness, it's the antidote to guilt and, and um, uh, the idea of uh, needing punishment. You so 50 strokes of the cat. If people would be really bad, I'd give them 100 strokes. I, I like it. <laughs> you, you talk about later in the book, you talk about a control freak versus a kindfulness freak. And to me, it oh, yeah. seems one of the hardest things to do in, in, in the West is to flip that self-compassion gear. How do we? Yeah. How do we do that? How do we do that? Is realizing that as you, as them, that you're the same as other people, and you know you give compassion to other people, you give compassion and forgive to so many. But why can't people do it to themselves? Is because we haven't been trained. You know, I was trained when I was a kid, so never be kind to yourself. Otherwise, if you forgive yourself or praise yourself, you get a big, big head. But I find if you praise yourself and forgive yourself, you don't get a big head. You get a big heart. The heart gets bigger with praise. And also, when you make mistakes, I look upon it like uh, a school. It's how we learn. It's that 70% uh, rule which I wrote in my book, yes, yes, yes. which you mentioned earlier. Because I learned that when I set my first math exam at school, I was a teacher before I became a monk. That's one of the reasons I became a monk. Look, anyone in the United States who's taught in high school, they would also think, 
maybe leave the world and become a monk. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff I mean, in high school. But I decided to go and um, I had to give an exam in maths. Mm-hmm. And the teacher, I senior teacher said, don't set it too hard. Don't set it too easy. Aim for a 70% average score. Easy people. Just it's a waste of time having the test if one gets 95, 100%. It's too difficult. People lose their motivation. They think they can't do the math. But 70% means everyone is motivated, and with the 30% where they make mistakes, that's where I, as their teacher, can realize their weak points. In the next lessons, I can address those weak points. There's things which I thought they'd understood, they obviously had not. So me, those mistakes were not uh, reasons to punish those children, but were reasons that I could find out how I could teach them better. So they were a growth area of education mistakes. Did you help them? This and I realize that's the same for life. It, it is, and, and I'm assuming later on you helped them to um, thrive in those challenges rather than to look at the challenges exactly. as, as negatives. Exactly, because a lot of people, they make a mistake and they just don't admit it. Just like in science, a lot of times if the result is not right, you actually fake it. And, uh, you know, you cross out the bad results and put in the results which should have happened. And that was so similar with life. You know, we live in a fantasy world, we write our own stories where, you know, we're always a hero because we don't know how to accept the mistakes of life. And one of those mistakes, obviously, is, you know, not feeling so good, being grumpy. What's wrong with being grumpy? (laughs) You know, it was just re- recently when it was like either Christmas time or Easter time or just a weekend, people would actually come up to me and say, now, have a, have a happy Easter. And I said, no, I'm not going to follow what you told me to do. Uh, don't be a control freak. If I want to be grumpy over Easter, I demand my right to be <laughs> grumpy. You don't have to be happy. Even the United States Constitution, it does uh, start off with the right to the pursuit of happiness. And I want to make an amendment. You can help me on this. Mm-hmm. The right to the pursuit of happiness or grumpiness, <laughs> whichever one you want. Can we go with the right to <laughs> the pursuit of non-judgmentalness <laughs> on any I of it? even better. Exactly, because why do you have to be happy? You have a whole industry in places like the United States of having to be happy. That's why that, uh, that title was a take on an advertisement which was on many billboards to the United States. You know, don't worry, be happy. Mm-hmm. And I thought that could really piss off a lot of people and upset them because they don't feel like being happy, not having a good day. Is there something wrong with me, something else I've done wrong in my life? And you feel even more guilty because you're not happy. <laughs> so because of that, we say, no, don't worry, just be grumpy. If you feel like being grumpy, be grumpy. And that has this wonderful effect that if you're happy being grumpy, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> See, this is one of the this is one of the big challenges of the the positivity movement. And I'm I'm seeming as a very positive person, but I step in just as much as anybody else. And and, exactly, and, yeah. and I'm the first to to admit it is we've been told if we watch The Secret, if we watch all of these these other which which have beautiful premises to them that that thought is an energy and emotions are an energy, which is true. If we don't allow ourselves to have that energy, then we're being judgmental about having a rough day. Yeah. And then we make it 10 Indeed. times worse. No, we don't. We deny it. We hide it. We don't admit it, which means we don't learn from it. Mm. So we just uh, we suppress it. So when you do have any thoughts have a rough day, you do something stupid, tell everybody about it. <laughs> Make them laugh. I'm having a rough day. I've been Woohoo! A- <laughs> <laughs> I was telling a few people recently that a part of my job, I went to the ICU of a local hospital to do some charting on this poor Chinese man who was really sick. He was dying. And I got some really powerful charting. So I gave this charting and the fellow recovered. It was like a miracle. And that's when I got into trouble because the family were very upset at me after he recovered. They said, look, you know, we'd come from overseas for the funeral. We'd arranged everything for the funeral. We invited you to come and chant for a peaceful death, not that he would recover. Wow. <laughs> and now we're in big trouble. <laughs> and so I made a big mistake. But, and I learned from that. And how I learned, when I go into a hospital when somebody's very, very sick and I do some chanting for them, I ask, what chanting do you want? 
do you want peaceful dying chanting or get better chanting? Wait a sec, who's the customer? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You've got to sort of ask the customer what they want, or at least what the family wants, and tailor it to their demands or their requests. So I made a big mistake. So I tell everyone about it. People laugh, and it's also that I learned from this. Mm -hmm. I think it was a very good mistake. I think I think the gentleman on the bed there, who you who you chanted over, um, was probably coming from a place of gratitude <laughs> for that mistake. I don't know because I think he had to die in another three months' time, which is prolonging uh, the inevitable. Oh no. And all the family had to go on these expensive tour uh, trips on the aircraft from their their home countries over in Asia. Had to come back again. So what you're saying is you you um, you created more suffering. So I did on that time. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I created a lot of happiness when I laugh at this. So you learn from these things. So let's let's talk about. You have some real positive, for lack of another word, takes on some things. For instance, you said you don't treat schizophrenia, and and that was oh, fascinating and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful to me. Exactly, because look, you label someone as a schizophrenic. There's no such thing as a schizophrenic. Please excuse me. There's people who have episodes of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And if you know anybody like that in your family or in, as a friend, you know that you know, there are many times in their day they're, they're, they're just like everybody else. They're very beautiful and they can relate to you and have a wonderful time. But when you actually label people as a schizophrenic, you actually are encouraging that sort of behavior. You're judging it. You are stigmatizing it. And it makes it much worse. And so by focusing on the other part of that person, you know, which didn't have that disease, they actually the disease actually lessened. You know, the, you're watering the flowers rather than the weeds, as I keep saying. Mm -hmm. It's the same with anybody else who's got any problems in life. You know, you, you're not sort of an addict. You are, you are a person, much bigger than the addiction, who sometimes falls into this addictive behavior. But you're much bigger than that. People who are criminals in the justice system. There's no such thing as a criminal. There's no such thing as a murderer. You talk about working in the prison and helping people so that they never come back. And one of the things that you say, yeah. and this is a real hard one for people in this society to get, is you said there's no such thing as a sex offender. Correct. There's someone who's done some terrible sex offenses and they've hurt people. Mm -hmm. But if you label people as a sex offender... And you're given that title and they start to believe in it. Then they start acting out the role which we expect them to act on. They become sex offenders. But if you can let them see something inside of them, which is much greater, much more beautiful, and much more sensitive and caring, mm -hmm. and this terrible thing which hurts another people, another person for your own sexual gratification, you see something else inside of you, then that gives you self-respect. It gives you something to work on. And you realize you're not a hopeless case, which means that you can actually grow and develop and you can get out of that terrible, terrible, self-destructive and other people destructive type of behavior. It's just uh, focusing on the other part of you. So this is so important for, I, I think of myself and growing up and I was labeled as ADD. I even wrote a book on ADD and, uh, and, yeah. and, and I told my wife, you know, I've got this book. She goes, why are you acting this way? I've got this book. I can show you. She's like, I don't give a damn about the book. You're not how you label yourself. <laughs> she called me exactly. dead to rights. <laughs> exactly. That's the way to go. And we sometimes believe all these labels which people give on us. Mm -hmm. And because we believe in them, we actually act them out. Yeah. Uh, in that first book, there was uh, this experiment which was done in UK years and years ago, which had changed my whole life about how you, you label people. Two classes mm -hmm. in the same year, same grade, exams at the end of the year, and they usually split them up, one class A, one class B, but they split them up absolutely equally. Yep. That's the kid who came first went in the same class as the one who came 5th and 6th, ninth and 10th, 13th and 14th. The kid who came 2nd and 3rd went in the same class as the one who came 6th and 7th and so on. Even, they called one class A and one class B. And they did not know they were even. And just after one year, when they gave the end of the grade uh, exam again, the children in, cra in grade A, in class A, did so much better than those in class B. Literally, by calling them Class A kids, they became Class A kids. 
Now, this is one of the problems. You call a person in society a class B person, mm -hmm. whether it's because of race, religion, or some uh, psychological misbehavior. You call a person like that, they actually become it. If you call you know, uh, your wife selfish, she actually becomes selfish. If you call your wife beautiful, she becomes beautiful. Check it out. <laughs> I love it. And, and maybe we can even take the corollary one step further. What we call ourselves, we become. Exactly. Exactly. That's a big problem, a lack of self-esteem. We keep calling ourselves useless, uh, hopeless. We can't do things. We're full of mistakes. We're full of shit in the bad sense. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what we become. We act it out. We call ourselves schizophrenic, mm -hmm. and we become schizophrenic. So going from there, let's talk about a real fun one, which is receiving yeah. praise. And uh, ah, I think you have a really fun expression that you'd say. If I said, wow, you just gave me a really great interview, you would say. Yeah. Thank you. I deserve that. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why is it that people would accept criticism if you said that was a stupid interview and I think, oh, yeah, you're right. I'll try better next time. We accept criticism straight away, but praise. You know, we say, oh, no, no, that was nothing. Or we think, you know, what are you trying to do? You're trying to get me on your show again? Have you got some sort of ulterior motive for praising me? What are you trying to get out of this? <laughs> We're suspicious of praise. Mm -hmm. We are. And this is one of, the reasons, one of the reasons why we have lack of self-esteem. We have lack of self-worth. Well, we go into addictions with drugs, ice, uh, alcohol. It's all because we think we're not worth it. And it's building up another person's self-worth by praising them and teaching people to accept that praise. Because this came from a story when I was given an award, like a prestigious medal here in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the way you're supposed to accept these things was say, I don't deserve this. Other people should have got this award, not me. You know, you see that on the Oscars. You see that everywhere when somebody gets given some commendation. But then I realized that there's some very smart people that looked at what I'd done, really smart people, mm -hmm. and they decided I deserved this award that year. And who was I to actually to question their wisdom? So I decided from now on, if people do praise me, I'm going to say, thank you, I deserve that. Woohoo! Which means <laughs> it encourages people to praise more. Mm -hmm. Because what's the point of praising you, Michael? You know, if you just say, ah, it's not worth it. So if I praise you for a great interview, you say, yes, thank you, I deserve that. Which means you try even harder next time to make it even better. If I criticize you, this is a stupid interview, you lose your motivation, what's the point? I'm going to get another job. And of course, you know, you don't improve, you don't grow. Thank you. So praise is important. So well done. That's a great question. You're amazing for asking that question. Well, thank you. I deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, let's segue into where and why spiders are safe. Okay, yeah. Now, that because I run monasteries and temples, and we don't get any money from government, so we're always trying to raise money for this and for that. And so, you know, get donations. Any of your uh, people listening to this who run a church or any other organization or scouts or whatever, you can use this story. Because once there was a spider who was just freshly born and built the first web in the corner of somebody's house and put so much effort into making the most beautiful web. And once it was finished, it sat in the middle of the web waiting for lunch, like a fly or a mosquito coming. But before it even had much of a rest, let alone lunch, the owner of the house came with a big broom and smashed the spider's home to bits. So the spider had to run away. He went to the next house, made another web, same thing happened. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight houses. It built a web and every time never had time for a rest or any lunch. And afterwards, after the eighth time, its house was destroyed. It was walking away. And it had, you know, what we recognize these days as uh, PTS, post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. syndrome. It was, it was terrified of corners of houses. Just like, you know, the veterans re returning from overseas, mm -hmm. you know, they, they have nightmares about the action they, which they had to endure, you know, in the Middle East, say. And this spider was just the same. It suffered from post-traumatic stress. 
And so it, was, it didn't want to go into any other house to try another web. It only just escaped from its, with its life. And as it was walking down the road, hungry, tired, it started to get depressed, started to think, no one loves spiders. All I want to do is just find a little corner of somebody's house, and I don't harm them at all. They don't even like the, the flies and the mosquitoes. I catch them for the people. I do a service. And that's all I ask, just a corner. Please leave me alone, but no one loves spiders. And it started to get sort of uh, this terrible self-guilt. must have done something wrong in its life. And so I was walking down the road, getting more and more depressed. Mm-hmm. And from depression, we usually start to get into suicidal thoughts. So the spider got so suicidal that no one will ever love me. I'll never get a home. No, no friends, no food. What's the point? So I deliberately tried to crawl under people's feet in the sidewalk, under their shoes. But always managed to find that space between the sole and the heel. <laughs> never could, cause, and then it tried to cross the road go under the wheels of a truck, but always got between the wheels, never underneath them. Because it's something which anyone who's depressed sometimes knows. You can't do anything right when you're depressed. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully in this case. Uh, thankfully, yes. So it was staggering down the road like a drug person, not knowing what to do, when it felt somebody's eyes on it. And it turned around and it was this fattest, happiest spider you could ever, ever imagine really fat and really jolly. And the suicidal spider looked at this fat spider and said, hey, how come you're so fat and you're so happy? And then the suicidal spider started to tell the sad short story of its life. Eight houses, eight webs, all destroyed, and no one loves it, and no one is so hungry. And as it was doing that, it started to cry. And so the big fat spider reached into his pocket and gave it a tissue to, <laughs> to wipe his eyes. <laughs> and after he wiped his eyes, the, suicide, the suicidal spider looked at the fat, happy spider and said, Hey, how come these things never happen to you? Why do they happen to me? You're so fat and jolly. And the silly fat spider said, well, I just built uh, one web in my whole life. Only one is still there, and there's plenty of food. Why didn't you come and stay with me? Because fat, happy people are usually very kind and compassionate. And the suicidal spider said, hey, before I accept your offer, I want to know one thing. Where on earth, in the modern world, can you build a spider's web where no one ever disturbs you? And he said, oh, I built my web in the donation box of the Buddhist temple. <laughs> no one ever did you in there. <laughs> dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. So if you're running a church or any other donation box, you can tell that story. No one ever disturbs the spiders in the donation boxes of the churches. <laughs> so at the end of the interview, we're going to make sure we get your website and get people over to you. Website? Was that a terrible joke about the spider? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> from there how how do we begin to put down the burden to put down the 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 stress the anxiety the woe is me the i'm not making light of the ptsd but all that we're carrying on us yeah okay first of all know that you can mm-hmm. that you have permission to do so you don't have to go around the pain of the past you don't have to feel guilty about yourself you don't have to punish yourself. There is an alternative. To know you can mm-hmm. is the first step. The second step is realizing it's worthwhile for you and other people. People always feel that if they don't punish themselves, they'll do worse in the future. That if they don't get angry at others, they just let bad things continue. And number two, realize it's in your interest and other people's interests. The first is knowing you have a choice. Mm-hmm. I can you have a choice to let go. And realizing that choice, finding the place where that choice can be made is the first step of freedom. Second is realizing it's in your interest and everyone else's interest. It makes you a better person, makes a better world, and you can let go. And those are the two most important steps to realizing you have the choice and the choice is worth making. And then from there on, it's pretty simple. Thank you.
How important is meditation? How important is meditation? I have a cup of water here which everybody can see. Hopefully, here we go. Yep. Here we go. This cup of water, if I keep holding this for too long, my arm aches. Mm -hmm. After one minute, I'm uh, in pain. After two minutes, my arm is really, really in agony. And after three minutes, they'll probably have to take me to hospital because I'm a very stupid monk. When this <laughs> gets too heavy to hold comfortably, all I need to do is to put it down. Mm -hmm. Maybe just for 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds of resting, I'll pick it up again. And it actually feels lighter. It's the same weight in this cup. But when I know how to rest, it doesn't bother me anymore. This is stress in our life. Stress has nothing to do with how much work you do. It doesn't have anything to do with how many duties and responsibilities you have. It has everything to do when your job, your responsibilities are too heavy to hold for a while. When they're really burning you up, put it down for a little while and rest. And then afterwards, after a few minutes of rest, you can go back to your work. Your mind is recharged, you are clear. And those 10, 20 minutes you spend letting go in meditation, you make up afterwards with greater efficiency. Uh, I taught this for a long time now. It's on Harvard Business School somewhere. <laughs> and they call it an investment in time. Ooh, I like it. Half an hour of meditation, you make up in the afternoon mm -hmm. with more efficiency. Your brain works to a much better level. You get more work done, higher quality in less time. For myself, I tend to come up with a large list of questions to ask guests before a show. And one thing that I'm being very careful to do is then to go from that list and drop everything. And if I take Excellent. that time to drop everything, it all tends to work out. If not, it probably works out too because there's no such thing as not working out. But one is in a state of stress and anxiety and the other is coming from a completely different arena. You're coming from life rather than fantasizing. Mm -hmm. Fantasizing when we have all our plans, we think it all out first of all, we imagine what we're supposed to do. And that's not the real world. The real world never follows your plans. Mm -hmm. The real world is where we, it's a great adventure. We never know what's around the next corner. But we have this wonderful confidence to know that, well, if I do, if there is dog shit around the corner, it's fertilizer for me. And if it's the beautiful flowers, I can really enjoy them. Mm -hmm. Both ways of I win. So we face the future without fear, which means we don't have to have any plans, which means that things go much more uh, beautifully and much more richly in our lives. So that's why when I give a talk, I never plan what I'm going to say. And you get some interesting avenues of discussion, which you never really expected to, to, to think about or talk about. And that's life. I like it. Can you share with us briefly about Friar Tuck and laughter? Friar Tuck and laughter. <laughs> okay. It was because you can't see my whole body here, but you know, some people call me fat because you know, I've got a large stomach. Uh, one of the people asked me, how should we address you, Ajahn Brahm? Is it Venerable Ajahn Brahm or His Holiness? And I said, no, my official title is His Roundness, <laughs> Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> 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 yeah, and anyway, uh, but it's not fact, because I've been a monk now for 42 years, and every year you're a monk, you grow in compassion and kindness. Mm. So every year your heart gets bigger. And now my heart is so big, so I can go back a bit so you can see it. My heart is so big. Oh, I love it. This is <laughs> this heart has been pressing down and out here. That's the only way it can go. So this is not fat. This is a big heart. <laughs> how, <then laughs> I've got to ask. How did... And, and fat, fat, and he was happy. So, and he was religious. So he's my mentor. Yeah, it, it, I would argue, and I think you are making a statement for in the book that to be fat and happy, truly happy, is a yeah. lot healthier than to be stressed out and skinny. Exactly. And this is science. It shows you that if you are uh, stressed out, if you're ups upset, angry, then actually your blood vessels contract. Mm -hmm. So if you've got any gut going through your blood vessels, you get heart attacks and strokes. But if you're happy and if you laugh, your blood vessels expand which means more stuff can go through. 
I am so happy, laugh so much. My blood vessels are so wide, they're like super highways, so they never get jammed <laughs> up. <laughs> <laughs> Which explains fat people. Have you ever noticed that fat people are always happy? You never see a fat, miserable person. Because the fat, miserable people died a long time ago. Oh, no. <laughs> the fat, happy ones. <laughs> they're just survivors. <laughs> okay. You. Can you tell us what uh, two quick wrap up first? Where do people go to find out more to find your books to to find you? Okay, just googling B R A H M, Brahm. And if you want to know how that's spelled, it's B for Buddhist, R for Roman Catholic, A for Anglican, H for Hindu, and M for Muslim. Brahm. Beautiful. I'm sorry about the Jewish community. I couldn't actually fit that in, but I got five <laughs> of them. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then find it on. And then the last question okay. I have is what brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? Just being here. Thank you. Not going places, but being here. I do travel around the world a lot. When I travel around the world, it's very rare to see a human being. They're always going places, always doing stuff. But to find a human who is being here, not going somewhere, not doing something, but being here. That is the greatest joy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, don't worry, be grumpy, and grumpy. shine bright. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Hey, see you. Thank you hey, so much. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, InspireNationShow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>